Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program, What You Need to Know webinar. A couple of housekeeping items before we get started. Um, we have your lines muted just to control for background noise. If you have questions, um, you can enter them into the Q&A, which you'll find um, on the bottom of your Zoom screen on the toolbar. You can also chat in any questions you have um, if you're not able to use the Q&A. Um, and at the end of the webinar, we will be providing a link to the evaluation, and we do ask that you take a few moments to share your thoughts um, as we do use that information to help us improve. Um, and then you'll find on that evaluation as well that you have an opportunity to, um, to provide us with your contact information if you'd like to be added to our mailing list and you, and you are not already, if you had received this webinar announcement through another venue. So next slide, great. Um, I'm, Thinking many of you likely know us, but for those of you who may be new, I'd like to take a moment to share about uh, who we are. So our organization is Health Insight. We are a private, nonprofit, community-based organization uh, really focused on improving health and health care for our communities. And we are in primarily in four Western states, uh, Nevada, New Mexico, Oregon, and Utah, with additional operations in California and Washington. Next slide. Great. We are also uh, one of more than 30 regional health improvement collaboratives across the nation, and we are part of the network for regional health improvement collaboratives. Uh, all of these collaboratives are focused on working towards the goals of better health, better care, and lower cost through data and transparency, multi-region innovation, transformation support, and policy and practice. Next slide. Okay. Today's webinar is part of a cooperative agreement that Health Insight has with the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, focused on increasing access and sustainability for the National Diabetes Prevention Program in underserved areas of Oregon, New Mexico, and Utah. And on the slide, you'll see the five strategy areas that CDC um, has tasked us with focusing on. Next slide. During today's webinar, you will learn about how to become a Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program supplier, the Medicare uh, value-based model for, for DPP and how patients can qualify to uh, receive the benefit, and resources available to support organizations who are interested in becoming suppliers. So before I introduce our speaker, we're going to bring up just two polls so we can get an idea of who is in the audience. So if you can take a moment to answer these polls. Uh, the first one is, in which states do you plan to have a DPP or a Medicare DPP presence? And you can check all that apply. We'll just give you a mo few moments here. Okay, why don't we go ahead and end that one? Okay, great, thank you. Uh, looks like we have almost 50% in Oregon, about a third in Utah, and a little under a quarter in New Mexico. All right, so the next poll. Is have you applied to become a Medicare DPP supplier. <clears throat> <clears throat> okay, I think we can close that one. Great, wonderful. So it looks like we have a few of you that are um, in the process and several that are interested in, in applying. So wonderful. We're hopeful that today's webinar will help you along that path. So next slide. Okay. So I'm going to introduce our expert presenter now, Danielle Turpenseed. She is with Solera Health. She is the Vice President of Government Affairs and Policy for Solera Health. Danielle's role with Solera Health is to serve as a liaison 
uh, for interactions with Congress and other government agencies. Um, she has a background in law, public policy, and public health, and is an expert uh, working with Solera Health around Medicare diabetes prevention. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand it over to Danielle. Thank you, and um, uh, it really is a great uh, honor to be on the phone with the team from Health Insight and with all of you on the phone. I, I would uh, choke up and say I am by no means an expert, but uh, as was described, I am uh, located in Washington, D.C., and I've been doing diabetes prevention, DPP, uh, policy work for about four years now, so I guess that's why folks think that this is being an expert, but um, we're all here to learn together, and I learn stuff about this program every week. So again, it's really a pleasure to be here with you and the team. For today's webinar, I want to highlight the, the areas that I'm going to touch on. First, I'm going to give an overview of the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program, or the MDPP, as it's known. Also, I'm going to talk about Medicare DPP as a value-based model and show where that value-based component comes in. I'm going to describe how your organization can become a MDPP supplier. And finally, I'm gonna provide some resources to support organizations like yours that are interested or considering becoming a MDPP supplier. I do wanna highlight that, you know, again, throughout this presentation, please feel free to chat questions. I will get the questions from um, the, the moderators and we definitely wanna make this interactive and useful. Next slide, please. All right, let's jump right into it. The MDPP, I know it's very close to national DPP, NDPP, but unless I say the word national, I'm referring to the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program for this uh, part of the presentation. Next slide. Great. So the MDPP has evolved from the national DPP, or just the, the plain DPP. The Medicare Active Health Service, it is um, included now as of April the 1st of 2018 under Medicare as a preventive health benefit, a preventive service for those enrolled in Medicare. This program is a lifestyle change, so it is not intended to be a diet or a fad. Uh, it's intended to teach and promote lasting changes. And the good thing, uh, one of the things I like about this is that even for those 65 and older, um, the, the government not only recognizes the impact that the program can have on health, but also acknowledges that we're never too old to, uh, to make some positive changes in, in our lives, including uh, the ones emphasized in this program, which include dietary changes and increased physical activity. The result from this lifestyle change program is undoubtedly, you know, if, if people stick with it, they will see some weight loss, which will be great. But ultimately, we want this to lead to the prevention or the delay of the onset of type 2 diabetes. So again, this is not a, a weight loss program for um, getting into a certain size outfit. This is really about preventing uh, type 2 diabetes. This model, the DPP model, is based off of National Institutes of Health research, federally funded research. And from that, the CDC, Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, established the national DPP. And once CMS tested the DP, national DPP model among seniors and uh, determined that the result and that the program re resulted in cost savings, um, it was just made into a benefit. So uh, we're all at the start of something very new and very promising. The way that this is being delivered relies on in-person delivery and suppliers who participate in the Medicare DPP must first be part of the national DPP. Let's go to the next slide, please. 
Here's some overviews, uh, um, some definitions. The MDPP service period refers to at a minimum 12 consecutive months and at a maximum 24 months. So it's at least a year and depending on how a person does during that year in terms of meeting metrics, then they are eligible to continue on for up to 24 months, up to two years. The, the service period is thought of in two parts. One is core services, and the second part is the ongoing services period. The Medicare DPP is delivered in sessions, what um, some might refer to as a class, but the term that we use is sessions. And uh, sessions is a term that carries through the core, what's also known as core maintenance and the ongoing maintenance um, parts of the, the program. Okay, as I mentioned, we have a, a core services period. In that core services period, there is a core session um, and core sessions are provided weekly and that's during months one through six. So the first six months of the program, weekly sessions are delivered. And each time that we talk about a session, they're approximately an hour in length and they use a CDC approved curriculum. Next is uh, core maintenance. And those are sessions provided monthly during months seven through 12, again, uh, lasting an hour and using the curriculum. And finally, ongoing maintenance are monthly sessions as well, and those are delivered to people who have achieved both attendance and weight loss um, goals, standards that have been established. And there's a maximum of a year for the ongoing maintenance sessions. The difference, um, key difference is that for the core sessions uh, during months one through six and months seven through 12, people who are eligible to participate in this program can continue to participate in those core sessions. But when we get to ongoing maintenance, that's when um, individuals have to have met particular standards. Let's uh, go to the next slide so we can understand this a little bit better. Okay, great. Right here again, just want to reemphasize the gray box shows the, um, the umbrella term for the entire program. The MDPP services uh, are approximately an hour in length always and must use a CDC approved curriculum always. If we drop down to the second level, you see where I have core. Core spans months one through 12, and again, that's guaranteed. Moving to the right, where it just says ongoing, that spans months 13 through 24, and that's performance-based. CORE is further broken down into months one through six, also known as CORE, and CORE maintenance, months seven through 12. I wanna dwell on this point for a second. During the CORE phase, and you see in the, the fourth line where it says it's delivered in 16 sessions weekly, it's expected that from participating in the weekly classes, following the CDC approved curriculum and exercising, that during those months, an individual should be able to achieve the goals of the program, which include at least a minimum of a 5% weight loss. When we think about the, the green box that says core maintenance, the fact that, it's, that it has maintenance tells us that it's expected that a person has already achieved a goal and they're working on how to maintain that goal. So by month seven through 12 or sometime in there, it's expected that individuals participating in this program will have um, achieved that weight loss. If you look on the um, under core maintenance, you'll see that the, the months seven through 12 are broken up into two intervals. Interval is always going to be a three month period. So there's a first interval and a second interval. Just by the nature of the um, months that are involved, you can understand that the interval one consists of months seven, eight, and nine. 
and interval two consists of months 10, 11, and 12. And again, during the, the core maintenance phase, the sessions are delivered monthly. And then uh, continuing to the right, if a person um, makes it to the 12 month mark and has achieved the goals, which I'll get into, they are eligible for ongoing maintenance, again, delivered in intervals, so a set of three classes uh, over three months. And um, that would be, if, if someone successfully, successfully makes it through, that would be the basis of the 24 months of participating in the Medicare DPP. Can you click uh, to show the, great, stop right there. I wanted to give an example of some of the topics that are included in the 16 sessions, the ones that are delivered weekly. As you can see from some of the titles, manage stress, finding time for fitness, taking charge of your thoughts, staying motivated, um, shop and cook to prevent T2. T2 is what we refer to in this program as type 2 diabetes. So not necessarily emphasizing the, the word diabetes that much, but certainly that is the, the focus. You'll see that the topics of the session focus around a couple of themes. One is physical activity, so get active and time for fitness. Another one deals with um, uh, positive thinking, stress, coping um, mechanisms. So managing stress and um, taking charge of your thoughts would emphasize those kind of topics. And another area, the third area I would say focuses around food and nutrition and healthy eating. So engaging people how to um, shop for food, how to prepare food, what to eat, how it affects their body. Those are all delivered during the, the first 16 weeks. Can you press down again, please? I have these topics up here, which span not only the core maintenance, but also the ongoing maintenance. And these topics um, covered in both of the maintenance phases are meant to reinforce and drive home that which was taught originally during the weekly sessions. So um, more about carbs, um, learning more about topics that have already been touched upon, now talking about sleep, get enough sleep, or getting back on trap, track, particularly if people, you know, have started to backslide from some of the progress that they've made. Um, the idea is that the fundamentals are taught during the weekly sessions, and um, the monthly check-in, the touch points, are to encourage and to, um, to reinforce. Uh, can you press again, please? Just want to highlight um, some, key for, some key features of the Medicare Diabetes Prevention Program are that it's a once per lifetime service, meaning this is not intended, CMS does not intend for someone to enroll every year or every other year. Um, you're supposed to get the teachings from the program and make that lifestyle change. This is to be delivered in person, um, so virtual, Delivery exclusive is not uh, a part of what CMS plans to reimburse. And it's totally fine and, in fact, intended for this to be group-based. So this is not necessarily one-on-one -on -one counseling, and it goes beyond what you might get from um, a nutritionist, but this is intended to be a class-based in-person kind of operation. A baseline weight is that weight that's going to be measured on the first class uh, that anybody goes to, and it's going to be recorded by their um, their lifestyle change coach, their coach. Um, that is also to, one, set the marker for what the weight loss goal needs to be, but that also lends to program integrity, making sure that uh, the amount that is recorded as a starting weight is really what, what we're going for. And I did want to also mention that a person who is eligible and, and who is participating is allowed to switch between uh, Medicare DPP 
suppliers, meaning the, the individual that's delivering. And I probably will get to it um, throughout the presentation, but did want to emphasize that the delivery of these sessions can be done by a layperson. It does not have to be a clinician. However, the person does need to be trained on the curriculum, and the training is usually about two or three days talking about, you know, motivational coaching, motivational interviewing, and some of the fundamentals that are in the, uh, in the approved curriculum that the CDC feels it's important for individuals to learn. Next slide, please. I have this page with content from the CDC. It's sourced down at the bottom, but this emphasizes what the curriculum requirements are for the uh, Medicare DPP. And again, the first bullet says it all. The top goal is to prevent type 2 diabetes. Hands down, that's where the emphasis of this program is. And the, the desire is that, as opposed to a fad, that avoiding or preventing that type 2 diabetes comes from making life, lasting lifestyle changes. Um, not just going through the classes and being done and going back to whatever eating habits put someone at risk for diabetes, but really making that, that change. The, um, the goal of the program is to uh, have moderate changes in diet and physical activity that results in at least a 5% weight loss in the first six months. So, you know, it's, a, it's somewhat aggressive, but totally doable. Um, I think when people get started, they, you know, hear 5% and then they're watching each pound um, that they're trying to take off, but we also have to be conscious about the pounds that we're taking in, the food that we're taking in. The, the curriculum stresses strategies. It's not um, a book of recipes or the same thing for, uh, for everyone, but again, this is um, really trying to emphasize a way of life for the individuals. And people are weighed in at each session, so um, not a whole lot of, of uh, materials not a resource intensive program per se, but each program will have a, a scale to make sure that people can weigh in. Next slide, please. Just listing some of the program uh, elements of this. One is, I, I've emphasized it, a CDC approved curriculum. Again, this is not a paleo diet or um, any of those other fads. This is or, or even approved diets, this is um, a scientific curriculum based on eliminating the risk for diabetes. Again, sessions will always be approximately one hour in du duration. Weigh-ins occur at each session, and um, the, the, the goal is to prevent the diabetes and to achieve a minimum weight loss. The program is, um, again, covered by Medicare, so there is no cost sharing. The health plans that cover their members are responsible for either reimbursing their delivery for, um, you know, for organizations that are delivering, but at no time are costs supposed to be borne by the Medicare recipients. And the uh, basis of this whole structure of the Medicare DPP was in the 2018 Physician Fee Schedule Rule. That's where the policy comes. Next slide, please. Again, just emphasizing the 5% weight loss as compared to the baseline, that's a goal, and it's supposed to be sustained. And ultimately, this leads to a reduction in blood glucose and the avoidance of diabetes. So here I'm making the distinction with the the two sides of the slide, the left and the right, um, regardless of weight loss progress, individuals are um, participating in a 12-month intervention divided into months one through six with 16 weekly core sessions and months seven through 12 
with at least six monthly sessions. And that's without regard to whether the weight loss target has been met. But if we look down at the bottom of this slide, if an individual achieves and maintains a 5% weight loss, they're able to proceed through the program to months 13 through 24. And in three month intervals, they'll be evaluated on whether they have not only attended class, so attendance, but whether they have maintained that weight loss. We don't want to see yo-yo, uh, yo-yoing, um, fluctuate fluctuations with the weight, and we um, definitely don't want to see the the trend going back, um, you know, to to a person gaining. Next slide, please. All right, we're going to talk about the beneficiary eligibility, but before we do, I just wanted to check in with my colleagues. Um, I know that there was one question, and I believe I did address it during the presentation, about whether lay individuals can lead the sessions, most definitely. Next slide, please. Continue to, to uh, type your questions in the chat for us, too, though. All right, there are five basic criteria for seniors who want to participate in the Medicare DPP. One, quite simple, a person has to be enrolled in Medicare. Number two, they cannot have type 1 or type 2 diabetes when this program starts. The exception is for women who have ever been diagnosed with gestational diabetes. They are allowed to participate. But um, those individuals who at the start of this program have uh, type 1 or type, di type 2 diabetes would not be able to participate. I do want to note that if individuals are eligible, participate, and develop diabetes, they will not be kicked out or, you know, asked to leave the, the program for that reason. Number three, Individuals cannot have end-stage renal disease. Um, the, and contrary to the position with diabetes, those individuals who do develop end-stage renal disease will be excluded from participating in the Medicare DPP. It's, it gets at the basis of the kind of treatment and care, the emphasis that end-stage renal uh, individuals have whereas the um, topics taught and shared during the sessions for someone who has been newly diagnosed with diabetes were felt to be, you know, in line with the Medicare DPP. In order to be eligible for this program, an individual number four has to have a BMI or body mass index of at least 25. If that individual is self-identified as Asian, the BMI standard can be lowered, is lowered to 23. So uh, a person has to be um, within the range, 25 or higher, or 23 or higher. So that gives us something that we have to work towards in terms of losing, losing the, the weight. And then finally, the, the clinical aspect of this requires each person who wants to be a participant in this program to have a blood test result. I've listed the three blood tests that are acceptable for um, determining eligibility. However, a person must only have one of the three. One of the three tests that has ranges between those that are listed is able to qualify. A person doesn't have to have all three of the tests. And the test must have been taken, the blood draw must have been within 12 months prior to enrollment. So somebody can't say five years ago, I had a 6.3 hemoglobin A1C. That may be the case, but we would need something more recent within 12 months. Next question, next slide, please. All right, let me just stop for one second um, because I do see a question before I go on that asks, how do we need to prove Medicare um, medic to Medicare that our participants has the, have the blood test results? Great question. There are documentation requirements for the suppliers. 
So an uh, individual can bring their own lab tests. The supplier can get their, um, so the supplier can get the lab results from a physician or from, you know, an insurer if they exist. I think a lot of people will bring the lab results to the, the course that they want to engage in. Um, but it is necessary for the supplier to verify and to retain a copy of the blood work. I, and I'll get into um, I'll get into it uh, explaining a little bit more about the Solera model because you know fortunately for the uh, participants in uh, the Solera network, uh, our company is taking care of the blood requirements for the network partners who are in our network. Keep the questions coming. All right, now I'm going to talk about the MDPP as a value-based model. Next slide, please. All right, this is similar to the slide that I showed before. Again, emphasizing the gray box encompassing all of the MDPP services. We know now that's core months one through six, core maintenance months seven through 12, and then ongoing maintenance that can span from months 13 through 24. And you'll remember that the core maintenance is broken up into intervals, uh, two intervals that consists of three sessions, each delivered monthly, and ongoing maintenance is broken up into four intervals, still three months, still delivered monthly. I note here um, to the left where it says CMS performance payment structure. CMS laid out in the um, in the final rule establishing the Medicare DPP, the way that CMS plans on reimbursing under fee for service, you'll see there for attending the first session, the MDPP supplier gets a payment of $25. For an individual attending a total of four sessions, a payment of $50 is made. And finally, for someone attending nine sessions, $90 is remitted. Now, don't um, confuse that for attending session number four or attending session number nine. It's uh, the aggregate for attending four sessions and then attending nine sessions. Continuing to the right in the middle under the first green box, here we're starting to get into a bit of a value-based proposition. $15 is paid for each interval if someone attends but does not have the 5% weight loss, whereas $60 is paid for each interval to someone, uh, for not to someone, $60 is paid uh, during each interval to the MDPP supplier for the beneficiary who has achieved at least a 5% weight loss. That right there is really a basis of um, the, the uh, value-based, that's where value-based comes in, because we're paying for the value of the services. We're not just counting how many people are coming through the door, but we're concerned with the throughput. We're concerned with the results. Continuing again, Along that same line uh, to the far right, you'll see that under the ongoing maintenance, there is a zero payment if a person fails to attend at least two sessions during an interval. Rem remember, an interval is three uh, sessions consecutively. And if a person fails to maintain that 5% weight loss, then the MDPP supplier gets uh, zero dollars in terms of reimbursement. If the participant does attend the three monthly sessions during the interval and maintains the weight loss, the payment is $50. This is at the heart of what we're talking about with value-based um, value based insurance design, value-based models, and frankly, you're going to see probably some more of this um, under the the current administration, but this is certainly something that spans um, both parties. This has been kind of uh, moving healthcare to this 
kind of operation has been in contemplation for a while. You'll see on the slide um, to the left where I have conditions. Remember that core is uh, guaranteed, but I have uh, sort of the stair steps there to show that moving from core maintenance to ongoing maintenance, there are certain things that a beneficiary must have. One, they must have achieved a weight loss of at least 5% from that baseline weight from the first session. And that person must have attended at least one in-person core maintenance session during the second interval during months 10, 11, and 12. So they must have attended at least one in person. And during um, that core maintenance, the person must have achieved or maintained the required minimum weight loss, which is 5%, as measured in interval number two. So months 10, 11, and 12 are, are particularly important for those who um, aspire to continue on to the ongoing maintenance phase. If a person does not achieve all of those three points, those three conditions that I have underneath the stair steps, then they will not be able to go on to the ongoing maintenance phase. I invite your questions always, but particularly if anything here is not clear or if you wanna understand the mechanics about the value-based model, how this is thought of as a value-based model, please feel free to type your questions in there. Danielle, I have a few questions for you if you're at a stopping point where you could answer them. Sure. Yeah, let's leave this slide up and, um, and turn to some of the questions. Great. Um, this is from Bridget Tadonio. Uh, she asks, can CPC plus practices participate? CPC. Comprehensive primary care initiative. Sure. The, you know, practices can participate. Um, the, the thing is, they would have to establish first with the CDC and go through um, a process consistent with the standards under the National Diabetes Pre Prevention Program, and then would have to apply to participate in the Medicare diabetes prevention program. But yeah, it's never too late. And um, certainly uh, we can make sure that information that's coming up after we get through some of these questions on how to become a MDPP supplier, we'll address some of that. We'll also be able to direct um, those entities that are not yet national DPP suppliers to how to get started. And uh, I have a colleague at my company, Solera, that um, will definitely walk through those who are interested in, um, you know, participating in the national DPP. And I would just add that we have some expertise at Health Insight around CPC Plus, so we're happy to take that question as well offline, just to confirm um, great. that there's no other considerations there with the alternative payment model. All right. Okay, great. Um, the next question is from Mikkel Drury. They ask, if the supplier is supposed to keep the lab results as proof of the participant's eligibility, how long do suppliers need to keep that paperwork? Sure, good question. There are, um, that's, that's getting into the weeds. There are uh, requirements for documentation. And, you know, fortunately, my, uh, my organization has detailed a lot of that. It is a, mm, I think it's a seven-year requirement. It's either a seven or a 10-year requirement for, um, I think it's 10, I want to say it's 10, 10 years, yeah, for, um, for keeping all of that information, and um, it's good to ask on the front end, it's not just a matter of getting people through the classes or when they drop out, there is a documentation requirement, because again, this is a, a federal program, and that's uh, consistent with the, um, the federal requirement. Okay. okay. This question is coming from David Vihill. He asked, what if an individual was previously diagnosed as having prediabetes and is now on metformin and has an A1C of less than 5.7? Do they still qualify? Yeah, the, um, the metformin as a medication to, you know, um, help people who are 
who are struggling with prediabetes, the, the key factor is going to be the lab results um, 12 months prior to when they wish to start. So if their lab results are less than 5.7, and um, that's all they have within this 12 month period, there may be something else that is suitable for that individual or that their health insurance plan may choose to cover. However, um, there are no considerations for, you know, in the, in the rules and, and the regulations as CMS has laid out for those who are uh, on medication and who, you know, face the, the pre-diabetes challenges in the past. It's um, strict interpretation. So if the, if the lab values aren't there, the, during the time frame, the individual would not be able to participate. Okay. And then one last question, and we can move on. Uh, Kathy Parkhill asked, what's the difference between a session and an interval? A session, great. A session is a class. A session is 60 minutes. It is a day, uh, I'm sorry, it's 60 minutes and it's an hour, it's a class. An interval is a time span of three months and within that three months, a um, classes are delivered monthly. Now, within an interval, there are three sessions. But a session is 60 minutes, it's, it's a class. The, the distinction comes in, um, if we look at this slide that's still up, I'm paying during the core related to sessions. So first session gets a $25 payment, attending a total of four sessions, you then bill for 50. If you move over to the intervals, I'm not paying per session, I'm, paying per, I'm getting paid per interval. So it's looking at the performance, the attendance over three classes as opposed to just one. And Kathy, if that isn't clear, I'm glad to, uh, you know, just send a message to the to the moderators, and we will uh, address that either offline or I'll try to to clear it up again. Let's continue with the presentation. If my colleagues don't have any other questions immediately for the queue, nope, you answer them all. All righty, let's move on to the big one, how to become an MDPP supplier. And, you know, I'll say at the onset, um, I'm here, the team from Health Insight is here, I have colleagues at my company, Solera. I really do enjoy being um, helpful, so don't think that this is um, a heavy task. We want to demystify this, and CMS, I'm sorry, CDC never intended for this to be um, a terribly bureaucratic um, program. So let's get into to how your organization can be a part of this as well. Next slide, please. This is a material that's produced from CMS and uh, they've provided a roadmap to becoming a Medicare DPP supplier that starts with the blue box um, number one. So learning about services, which you know, is in part what you're doing now. You're learning about, you know, what this entails, that this is a lifestyle change program and what's being emphasized, such as dietary change and increased physical activity. And, um, you know, so you're already taking the, the step on, uh, the first step to learn about these services. There's an enrollment process for organizations desiring to deliver the National Diabetes Prevention Program. Um, the, the National Diabetes Program is the precursor to being involved with the Medicare DPP. And that means that um, there's a website here on how to learn more on how to enroll in Medicare, but really, and we'll make that the website available, if, if you're not yet a National DPP, organization, that is the first step. The um, filling out an application, not terribly hard, uh, listing, you know, whether you have um, an administrator to oversee the program, who's going to serve in the role as a coach to deliver the program. Uh, those are the kinds of things that are asked. 
for Medicare, and I'm sorry, for national DPP by the CDC. And it's intended that an, uh, an applicant who's accepted, it will take, um, I'm sorry, within six months of their application, they're expected to start delivering the program. So just keep that in mind. It's not like you should apply now and plan on delivering this in 2020. Uh, within six months of your application and your acceptance, it's expected that you would be able to deliver the national DPP. Then um, once you've been delivering the national DPP for about a year, you can enroll, apply to um, Medicare and the green box uh, number three talks about enrolling as a MDPP supplier. And just we'll get, I'll, I have this in some other slides, but there's a paper application as well as an electronic application. Keep that in mind. And for the fourth box, um, delivering services uh, for at least two years, which encompasses the core phase and the ongoing phase. So it's not intended for um, anyone participating to just deliver core or just deliver ongoing maintenance. The expectation is for you to be able to deliver the uh, full suite of services that I posted earlier. And then finally, there's a, a part that um, number five talks about submitting claims and, and the payments. That is still um, being set up by CMS, meaning this is new for the MAX, the Medicare Administrative Contractors. Fortunately, for entities that are not used to submitting claims, there are resources. Again, my company is a resource, Solera, we're able to do that, as well as I believe Health Insight can provide some assistance with that as well. Is that correct? So we are helping uh, organizations kind of identify resources to meet their needs. We are not directly a third-party integrator, but we are. our role is to help, yeah, to kind of bridge people to what they need support on. Great, great. And, and you know, by help and support, you know, the, these, this program is intended to be non-clinical, community-based. Um, it's not supposed to be your uh, highly... Um, integrated uh, delivery organization like some of the big names that are out there so it's a process I want to encourage those that are thinking about entering into it it can be done so let us continue to work with you on how to how to get this started next slide please all right so supplier enrollment under Medicare began January 1st and important to note that oh, only organizations can enroll as suppliers. Of course, organizations are built upon the strength of individuals, but the, um, the enrollment entity must be an organization. Um, coaches that desire to deliver this must um, be affiliated and apply, if you will, through an organization. So, that's, that may be something new for between the Medicare and the national DPP. Suppliers have to comply with all of the Medicare supplier statutes and regulations and, you know, data privacy and security, et cetera. Um, and just note that the suppliers can't sell um, their code, their, their identification number. They must have also, in order for it to be a supplier, it must have a preliminary or full recognition. And I've got some information here on how to move from a pending status to a preliminary recognition status. I want to take a minute and just turn to, um, I meant to do this before we got started, but let's see if we can post a quick poll to see for uh, those organizations that are out there, what their concerns are related to becoming a supplier. So sh you should have a question up, up right now, poll number three. What do you foresee as being the biggest barrier to you becoming an MDPP supplier? You can check all that apply. Uh, one is the technology, another is security, 
And a third would be the translation of the curriculum. By that we mean into another language, per, per, perhaps. So go ahead and fill that out. Just take a couple of seconds. Let's go ahead and close that poll if you can. All right, uh, interesting to see where the you know, challenges lie. So tech 60, security, and by that I mean, I'm sure that means like data security, information security, and then the translation of the curriculum. That's helpful because as I go along through these um, slides as we finish up, I will be able to demystify some points related to those topics. So let's continue to the next slide, please. I do have here um, just screenshots of both the PECO system, P-E-C-O-S, the electronic um, application system, as well as the Medicare enrollment application for MDPP paper-based, um, the CMS form that are there. Keep in mind it's about 75 days on average to um, from time of processing I'm sorry, from time of application to approval. And the application will include a site visit from um, a CMS uh, delegated contractor or MAC, okay? The, the suppliers, once coming into the program, are considered a high-risk category at the time of application. So that means going through the application and the site visits um, has, you know, a higher hurdle, but upon revalidation, renewal, is considered at a moderate risk. So the hardest part is up front. Don't, don't despair. Next slide, please. So I've talked about the coaches on a couple of occasions. I want to say a little bit more. The coach is actually the person who delivers the, the class, delivers the sessions. The coaches have to obtain what's called an NPI that remains active. And that's just a, a, a way of identifying coaches in the system. The, um, the organization that's applying to be a Medicare DPP supplier would include the coach's name, social security number, and that MPI on their application, on the organization's application uh, when seeking to enroll. Now keep in mind, coaches do not need to enroll in the Medicare program and should not be submitting claims individually. Okay, next slide, please. I did want to highlight that the um, virtual DPP, digital, virtual, you may have heard some other terms, are not allowed under Medicare DPP at this time. Medicare is only paying for in-person programs, but I did want to, um, you know, speak of it because it is cer certainly something that is uh, talked about and um, gaining increased notoriety under uh, DPP. So virtual programs include, you know, computers, laptops, anything using technology, but moreover, those where it's not an in-person coach standing in front of participant. Okay. Next slide, please. All right, I have some more of the um, Medicare supplier requirements. And um, the second bullet point talks about background checks and screenings for coaches that is in effect. There are also um, fingerprinting requirements and criminal back che background checks initially for the coaches. So this is, um, and, and it's expected that there'll be annual training on HIPAA and fraud and waste and abuse. This is typical of uh, a high risk category. And, you know, but we find it quite common among healthcare suppliers. Next slide, please. Again, we're gonna make these resources available. So um, don't feel like you have to write any of this down. Next slide. For the um, eligibility and documentation requirements, this question was asked, 
I know that the uh, records must be retained securely for a minimum of seven years. I was vacillating between seven and 10. Um, I can double check and find out where 10 was standing out in my mind, but there it is. And records must be maintained for each beneficiary's eligibility status. Next slide. There's um, specifics around engagement and incentive activities. Nothing that's done should be uh, an enticement for someone to sign up. So you won't say, sign up for this Medicare DPP and receive a free pair of sneakers. You wouldn't advertise that. Um, or you wouldn't say, uh, if you see what's unacceptable, sign up and you'll get a free smartphone. No. The, the items that are acceptable for engagement have to be things that lend towards the program goals and can be um, reasonably tied to the achievement of those goals. So these are just some examples that come actually out of the final rule. Next slide, please. I did want to note um, the administrative requirements under Medicare DPP and um, emphasize that all statutes and regulations must uh, be complied with under this program. And I've also listed some of the costs to register as a Medicare supplier. It's pretty standard. Next slide. All right, getting into the weeds, we have some information on compliance, supplier compliance, um, you know, particularly for organizations that are just beginning this process. I won't go through all of the, the details that are here, but just keep in mind that um, when, when starting up your program, you do have to consider things on the back end like fraud prevention, like um, compliance with, with uh, federal standards under Medicare. Next slide, please. Disclosures and complaints. Um, again, there's a complaint resolution protocol that suppliers have to adhere to that records, you know, the name and the Medicare number of individuals, the nature of a complaint. This is where I was thinking about the 10 years. That information must be retained for 10 years and available if, C if CMS wants to inquire. Next slide. Here's some helpful websites. Um, of course, CMS is, is running and standing up the Medicare DPP program. Uh, CDC for the National DPP program, lots of helpful information there. The supplier applications, both the paper form and the electronic version. I've also listed a group called the Council for Diabetes Prevention that is a association, a council of, of organizations focused strictly on preventing diabetes. And finally, my company, uh, Solera Health's uh, website, because we are um, working with many of the DPPs out there, getting them ready to see Medicare patients and bringing them into our network. And in return, um, providing a lot of referrals, patients um, who will be enrolled in their programs. Next slide. This is probably um, everything that you might have wanted to know. Um, these websites and these links related to Medicare DPP. Next slide. We've got the final rule. We've got payment codes, enrollment checklists. Um, again, more detail here. And next slide, please. All right. All right. Thank you so much, Danielle. That was tremendously um, helpful and lots of good information. Um, we will be sharing these slides after the call, so you will certainly have time to, to take a closer look at all of those wonderful links. We did have one question come into the chat. Um, how long does it take to be approved for NDPP? And Danielle, I can just take this one real quick. If you're using a um, already recognized curriculum, when you submit your application to CDC to become a uh, recognized DPP program, CDC will respond within 15 working days. Uh, 
to your application, at which time, if approved, you would become a pending recognized organization. If you prefer to submit an alternative curriculum, CDC um, uh, indicates that they will need four to six weeks to review and respond to your application. So thank you for that question. We are at the top of the hour, so just very quickly wanted to remind uh, people on the phone of our website as well. You're welcome to come here. We'll be working hard to keep it up to date with resources as well as links to these webinars um, and contact information for us if you're looking uh, for a little bit more information or need some help with where to go. We also have the DPP Help Desk uh, email uh, at healthinsight.org. You can email us there if you're not quite sure where to start and need a little guidance. Next slide. Um, I think we've, have we captured all the questions, Maria? Wonderful, thank you. And last slide, here is Danielle and my contact information. And we do ask that you take a, just a few moments to fill out our evaluation so we can see how we did today and um, look for opportunities to improve. And otherwise, thank you so much for joining us and have a wonderful day. Thank you, bye-bye.